Hello, everybody. Um, during, due to the sort of this lockdown situation, um, and just to own sort of personal reasons, I haven't been making a lot of content right now. So I'm just going to be doing this um, Zoom type stuff for the foreseeable future. Um, ideally, it's not what I want to be doing, but for now, it's just a temporary measure. So I hope you like it because regardless of like quality or whatever, I feel like this could be a good conversation. Um, so today I'm here with Jerome, who represents a charity called Unique Talent. And I'm just here to talk with him about kind of what they do. So hello, Jerome. You're right. Hi. Hello. Hi, Nick. And hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, so basically, if you could just sort of describe to me what you guys do as a as an organization. Right. OK, so Unique Talent is an organization that was founded in 2012 and it was incorporated in 2015. Um, we provide mentoring services, preventative workshops, and also creative courses for young people who are offenders and those who are at risk of offending. Um, over the lifespan of our company since um, incorporation, we have mentored about 200 young people and delivered presentations to 2,000 young people. Um, this, is this is including schools, community centers, many different um, community organizations that we network with and who are our partners. Um, yeah, that, that in a nutshell is what we do. So we run workshops to help young people um, be educated about what gang life is about, the reality of prison. So hopefully that will deter them and they stay away from that kind of life. And then we mentor young people who are already in the criminal justice system or on their way to becoming a part of the criminal justice system so that um, they may be able to you know, change their mindset in a positive way, see things in a different way, get employment opportunities and progress in their lives and their future. Um, for, you know, how I would put it is try to offer them some form of prosperity and redemption. OK, um, so how do how do you guys go about the workshops? What exactly do you do to sort of yeah. get get your ideas across to them? Well, well, I've been to a number of workshops. So what I'll say is um, I'll divide this into two. So pre the lockdown, we used to go into schools, into assemblies. And we also used to go to big, quite, quite big safeguarding conferences. Um, and then also, yeah, go into, we physically be there in locations and we would have a group of young people or have a group of professionals in the room and we would speak to them. We would deliver a workshop. Um, usually my colleagues would, would lead on that. And what they would talk about is that some of, uh, some of the directors of our company have been to prison. So they would talk about the experiences of going to prison. Also what led to them getting into prison because some of them were gang members, um, how they lived and also what made them rehabilitate and really their life story and their change. Now, but however, when we sometimes we deliver workshops to young people and we deliver them on a range of subjects such as peer pressure, um, negative influences and social groups and also legal structures as well. So I went to a presentation that was at Pollard's Hill Youth Club and this was last year, right towards the end of last year. And the topic for that workshop was with a bunch of young people, obviously at the community centre, or probably about minimum 30 young people in the room um and we were just talking to them about the legal structures so things like um kind of what happened you know what happens if you show particular behavior and what can happen to you from a legal context so for example a lot of young guys think it's okay to just go around and touch um another girl in whatever way that so pleases them yeah. but you know we're letting them know you can actually be put on a sex offenders register for that so we're educating them about the consequences of some things they think are normal, actually, and kind of challenging that normality. OK. Um, so that's just those are two examples of workshops. I'll just add that um, and I went to another workshop at, um, in Liverpool Street, at a massive safeguarding conference, and there were hundreds of people there. Um, at that workshop, we brought one of our young people who we've helped to rehabilitate in his journey, and he gave his own account. Um, of actually being stabbed, um, and this was a, a kind of a near fatal stabbing, okay. um, and also what he was doing in his life, and, and how our company helped him, and why he changed his mind and kind of lives differently now. Okay, so uh, what I'm getting from that is is it's challenging problematic behaviour. Do you assess? Do you assess particular individuals, or do you, do you just go into like a just speak to the group generally and just sort of warn them against certain activities 
Are you talking about our mentoring or preventative workshops? Um, more the preventative workshops, but the mentoring, I guess, is sort of self-implied that that's what you do, I guess. But Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, well, with preventative workshops, it depends because sometimes um, some, some things, like when we're entering a community centre, there are groups of young people from all different types of backgrounds. So it's not mm -hmm. possible for us to assess where they're coming from and who they are and what they're yes. about, kind of. Sometimes um, I've been to workshops in community centres and the manager of the community workshop, because they're on the ground and they know the young people who enter their centre, they might turn to us and say, you know, th that group of young people, they really did need this conversation because they, you know, they know who in particular might be exhibiting certain types of behaviour. Okay. We can't know that organisation, even though we are from the community and of it. Um, we are not on the ground in the same way youth workers are, okay. where we know who is who. Um, there are other types of workshops, though, that we run at places like pupil referral units. And um, those workshops, some of them are general assemblies um, of maybe year 10s and 11s, but other workshops actually are targeted towards specifically young people who are okay. exhibiting certain behaviours and, and hanging out with certain types of people. So what, what kind of, what kind of behaviours do you get called out to challenge when you're specifically targeting like in a PLU or? Yeah. So, so um, the, the type of behaviour is kind of, it could be either there's aggression in the classroom, okay. but then there's other kind of, there's other signs of these kind of things as well, such as um, how youths are congregating kind of together, maybe in, in the school or outside of the school. It may be the case actually that we can see that that the teachers actually can see that um there are certain young people, you know, they they are when they're leaving school, okay. they might go and meet up with a whole group of boys. And you know, the group of boys, even though it's not it's not right to probably judge everyone when tired yes. everyone yeah, of the same time. Yeah. But it, it may look as though kind of, you know, they may be doing something they shouldn't be doing or be hanging out with the wrong type of people. So you assess um what young people are doing in the school behaviorally. I mean, in terms of whether they're exhibiting aggressive behaviours, they could be insulting their teachers. Um, or sometimes the parents will pick up on things, actually, and they'll talk to the school about it. They'll say, look, my, my, my child is acting differently, actually, um, and they're, they're not behaving as they usually do. Okay. And it's those kind of things that we look out for. So how do you, how do you determine what is just normal, like, congregating as, like, friends and what could be potentially problematic? Yeah. Right, so, so w when it comes to it, usually, because it usually has to be two things at once. You can't say that a young person who's going outside of school when he leaves, he or she leaves school and hang is hanging around with a group of people, if, if their behaviour inside the school is perfectly fine, you can't necessarily turn around and say, well, oh, we think maybe they may be getting involved in things they shouldn't be getting involved in, because you actually can't isolate the behaviour that they're, that, the negative um, consequences of behavior that they're showing. So there's no proof actually that something might be going on that shouldn't be going on at the time. Yeah. Um, so it is a combination of the two things. You have to assess the behavior in the school actually itself. If, if all of a sudden the students start swearing at the teacher and do all kinds of stuff, basically, it may be a sign of what they're doing. Actually, we do have young people, who, unfortunately, and I, I'm applying what has happened and occurred in our mentoring to what would happen inside of schools. We'll get reports back from teachers um, that say to us that basically the child is coming stinking of, of marijuana. So you see, from when that's happening, these are behaviours that you can actually pick up on and yes. you can document. And then you can say, well, OK, there's something going on. But you can't just say a young person leaves school both, um, with a group of people yes. and that, therefore they're in a gang all of a sudden or they're going to go into a gang. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work that way. You have to see negative behaviours and characteristics come out first. OK, yeah, I, I think it's very important to do that, obviously, because you obviously don't want to generalise a young person and then, you know, potentially alienate them even further. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's an important, um, important thing to assess. Um, so what would you what would you say is your overall goal? Obviously, if you want to prevent um like criminality and violence and you want the young people to succeed in their own goals but do you have any other broad intentions when you're getting to a uh, mentor or to the um workshops right I, i'm gonna break this down into maybe three or four parts um, yeah three yeah. or four parts just to get this in 
our mission statement as a company really is that we wish to um to tackle the problem of criminality and youth violence in our communities predominantly in Croydon, Merton and Sutton that is our mission statement as a company we're trying to tackle that particular problem however the the mentors in our company who are also directors they um they have three different kind of approaches and reasons for why they do it so, so Michael Apia who is a mentor and is also um and it was also a managing director of the company his particular thing actually or the reason why he does what he does is he said look when i got involved into what i got involved in nobody ever told me the consequences no ever nobody ever explained to me what the lifestyle would lead to so my job um he says is to br- build the state of awareness so that young people can make a choice actually now obviously no one can control the choice that young people make but we can build them an awareness so you know if you do make this decision this is likely to happen to you so that's what michael appear does now russell williams um is, is different he the reason why he like he um it mentors young people and is a director of the company is cuz he wants to he loves to see the rehabilitation of people so he loves to see the change in their mind state and the transformation of the individual um and then christian douglas um who's no longer a mentor even though he's done a lot of mentoring during his time but he he is just um a managing director he goes with the business side of the company um his reason kind of for doing what he does is that he he wants young people to not make the same mistakes that he made so he actually wants to dive them off of that path now the last thing i'll say about it is for myself um i am an ex offender i should say and at the end of the day my my entire the, the my function in the company and the reason why i'm with this company is because i believe that young people should be offered prosperity and redemption i believe that at, um for me personally that they should have the ability basically to to uh, to show their full potential as human beings because many people are trapped by social circumstances whether that be poverty um crime many different social ills and those things tend to hamper and disinhibit the true um the true potential of an individual and the maximization of that potential so my job is basically the light that is inside of every young person that has to be shown into that has to be shown in as well and that that is the way i personally see it but I, i've broken it down for you okay. in a number of ways so you get our angle man so how do you how do you bring out that light do you do you do you set up activities for them or yeah yeah we we've set up a number of activities actually even from the beginning of our company um 5 years ago in, in terms of incorporation we incorporated music our music was a bit music workshops were a big deal in our are still actually a, a very big deal in our company um and we we used to go into the community centers and we did a positive song um we had a number of songs actually with young people and lyric writing workshops and we get them to produce songs and record those songs as well um so music has always been a, a big part of it in more recent times we've expanded really into fashion design as well. Um so we were able to to get some generate some funding for a fashion design course earlier this year. Um and now we have a young person actually who's going through fashion mentoring. So he's help he, we're helping him to set up his own clothing um brand, his own cl- um oh, his great. own yeah. brand of t-shirts, yeah. We've also dealt with sports as well. So we've done football in the past and only a month ago we were running a free month type of fundo course. um and we want some more funding to do another taekwondo course as well um taekwondo beauty um music again and yeah and and fashion again and um yeah so th- th- we provide a number of activities both as kind of a form of diversion but also because as christian douglas usually says the reason why he got involved in crime is he was highly motivated to leave poverty so for young people we want to help them set up their own businesses and and so that when they go back home they don't have to think that forever and ever I'm going to be trapped in a situation where my parents can't afford the bills or I myself one day won't be able to afford the bills and in addition to not being able to afford the bills you know um I'm not going to be able to to get my education and to get high skilled employment and to reach the level of income that I actually need to you know to have satisfaction in my life when Michael Apia first got involved in gang life he explained this because he saw his friends with trainers that his mom wouldn't get for him mm-hmm. and he saw his friends with nice clothes and nice things that his mom wouldn't get for him 
Um, and so that, and so when once he picked up, I don't have these things and I want these things, the next step for him is how do these other people get these things? And then when these people were getting these things by selling drugs and doing robberies and all these other kind of things, Michael Lafia decided, yeah, I'm going to follow them on that, really. I'm going to follow them down that pathway. Yeah. Um, and, and this is the thing. So empl employment and prosperity in that way is not just a diversion. Actively, it's actually a solution to a, a real problem that the young people have. Many of the young people are in poverty. And we can't just escape the fact that they are in poverty, if that makes sense. We have to, if you're not going to, if you're going to say don't do it through crime, you have to say solve your problem in a different way. And we do try to do that. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think that's, I think that's a really big driver. I think that's a really important thing to be doing as well. Like, because for many young people, obviously, they want to escape their situation and material stuff is what, unfortunately, what young people want. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, like, clothing and you know music and all this stuff and sports mm. it's i guess it's good to encourage them to do that in a positive way and let them know that they can obtain those things with sort of hard work and perseverance and all this sort of stuff um and also that's one point i'm sorry one point i would make is that i agree that that's those are very important things to young people i mean like you know, just like sportswear, especially, and you know, like different kinds of fashion and the music is that's mm. that's their hobbies. And why wouldn't yeah. we want to encourage them to do things that they genuinely enjoy doing and can help other people? Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. So I think it's really cool that you guys are doing that. Because um, sometimes I feel like young people can feel a bit like the expectations on them are a bit crazy, and they're mm. kind of like stuff they don't really want to do, like oh, I want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or, mm. you know, or go into a trade. And those things are great, you know, if, if that's what you want to do and that's what you're passionate about. But if a young person doesn't want to do that and they feel pressured, I feel like that pressure might sort of influence them to do things and make mistakes that they perhaps shouldn't be doing, if you understand what I mean. Mm. Are you, are you kind of, do you want my opinion on, on that particular point you've just raised? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 So so uh, with, with that, in terms of the pressure that young people may feel when um their parents are kind of telling them you have to go down a certain path and make your life happen in a certain way. The, the issue with that is actually if you don't, how do I put it? If you have no passion for what you're doing in the first place, then it is far easier, actually, for you to be diverted off that pathway um, by, by um, other influences. Then what that can lead to is it's very easy for them to come off focus. Yes. Um, because basically, yeah, yeah. So it's very easy for the negative influences to encourage them to do something different. Um, however, the, the fact is, for a lot of young people, even though you've described that some parents may want their children to become doctors and lawyers, um, or tradespeople and many different types of things. Unfortunately, for many of the young people that we work with and, are, and that we see in our communities, they don't, and even when we were growing up, we saw this as well. Many of them are not actually given aspirations that are very yeah. high. Actually. Um, and, and that in, its, in and of itself is a problem because if your aspirations don't match actually um, the amount of money that you'll be able to get, then you'll never have the quality of life that you actually want. And I, I've said this before in other workshops, that the causes of crime are very complex. And the fact is, there are many things that lead to a young person, not, how do I put it, getting the mind state, getting into a mind state where they want to do some, where they want to do very negative things with themselves. Yes, yeah. Part of that is obviously emotional, um, emotional scars for many young people. Some young people are not necessarily, um, they're not poor, actually. And mm -hmm. it's just that, actually, they've been, they may have gone through what, whatever form of domestic abuse or many different um, types of things that have made, that have given them the emotional scars that make them seek fulfillment from a gang instead of their family. Yeah. Um, so th that's one example. Other examples, really, of kind of, you know, social ills is that if you are, if, you are constantly in an environment that is surrounded by violence, actually. Some young people think 
I have to respond in that way. I have to fit into that environment. And they go into a survival instinct. And then obviously, we've touched on this before. We were talking about it. You know, the, the poverty itself is a massive issue in terms of um, where young people actually are able to get to and, and where they're able to go. So because the causes, the, the causes of crime are so complex, if the aspirations of young people are not able to fulfill, are not able to kind of, how do I get, mitigate all of the things that are holding them back in life, then there'll be a problem. So uh, when, when we got the funding actually to do a whole bunch of community center activities, which unfortunately now is on hold because um, the government's put us into lockdown, um, I, I was the one who wrote the application for that because that's yeah. kind of a big part of my job. I generate the funding. So I wrote and I explained to the funders, we are offering these activities as systemic protective factors. You see, for some young people, when they're going to go into a community center and go to a fashion course, that fashion course in the community center can be a safe haven um, that systemically protects them from a world outside of the community center, which is very chaotic and very dangerous for them. Yeah. Whether that be because they are witnessing the crossfire gang violence, whether that be because they're from a very disruptive, um, disruptive household. So these, these places are safe havens. And those safe havens are necessary for young people to be able to um, to kind of to get into a headspace where they're able to focus themselves and make mindful decisions in the most in the best way. OK, um, so how would you, how would you say the uh, COVID and the whole. The, the whole breakdown of those kind of supports might have affected young people in, in your sort of. Do you think it's, it's had a negative effect? Obviously, you know, you might not see everything because you're you know on lockdown as well but do you think it's problematic to do that regardless of the situation especially when it's such a um what's the word like a like a lifeline for young people yeah you see the the, the issues they come in stages at, at the beginning of the first lockdown in the beginning it wasn't very devastating for many young people actually mm -hmm. because they thought oh I'm, I'm out of school now i get to do what i want kind of thing um, and because they were out of school and doing what they want, it didn't get to them. But then after, you know, after a few, a month or two, when you're locked in your house constantly, eventually that does get to you. Um, yeah. During the lockdown, we faced cases of, of people, um, of people basically getting involved in domestic violence inside their household. You know, part of sons going after their mothers and all of this yeah. kind of thing. After they've just come out of prison. And, and then on top of, on top of that itself, if you already came from a household, where you were not comfortable in the home environment and you didn't like being at home, that just exacerbates the, the issues that you were facing from the beginning. Then add to all of that, that in your spare time, all of your leisure activities have been cut. So you may have gone to football, you may have gone and done basketball, and you may have gone and done a martial arts course, whatever you were doing. Now you're stuck at home instead. And all you can think is, um, I can't even chill with my friends at the moment. Why don't I just, get, why don't I just go and buy some weed and smoke it? And then yeah. obviously that, that has another effect, doesn't it? Because, you know, obviously the mental health difficulties that can come from, from taking drugs, but also in addition to that kind of, um, that could bring even more tension into the household. Because if your parent doesn't want you smoking drugs in the household, but you decide, you know, I'm just going to smoke weed whenever I want now. And on top of that, you know, weed can have these effects where it demotivates you and it makes you a lazy person and, and it affects your characteristics and your behavior, usually in an adverse way. Um, so that becomes an entirely different problem. And an issue that we particularly faced is just before the lockdown, we were supposed to send two different young people, actually, um, to a Prince's Trust job fair to help them um, advance their careers. That was scrapped immediately. So now what are, we, what are we supposed to say to them over the phone or by Zoom or by WhatsApp video call? Like, I'm sorry, you know, um, we know that we, we said that we've devised, a, um, a, you know, goals and plans with you and we've set you tasks. Um, to start to start completing so that you can meet your goals, but you know everything's shut down at the moment. Um, so actually, um, your life can't really go anywhere. Um, yeah. That's basically what the young people have been told. Basically, uh, I, yeah, I think that could be dev very devastating to a young person. Like, uh, I, 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 as when you're you feel like you're getting somewhere, and things are changing for you, and then all of a sudden all this stuff happens, and you, it, it, I, I think it could probably make them feel quite isolated. And yeah, yeah. even though it's not personal, obviously, because there's a situation in the world, 
it mm-hmm. might feel when you're not in a good mood and not in a good place in your life it might feel very personal and then you might mm-hmm. be more prone to lash out or do things that you shouldn't do and as you said like turn to substance this because you're bored which i think is mm-hmm. a big problem in in especially in british society um so how 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 do you think you're challenging this this new situation as your as your you know your company how do you think you're adapting to the situation right so so that when, when the lockdown initially happened we put in a covid 19 strategy actually um and we dive we, basically we became a very interactive company actually which is actually one of the reasons why we've met now and we're doing this interview yeah. because it's like yeah we had an instagram for a while but we weren't really on the instagram as much as we probably should have been um and when the lockdown happened our workshops that were delivered in community centers, schools, um, and other places, we started to deliver those workshops online. Now, the response online was quite immense in terms of a lot of people came to support us and saw what we were doing. At the same time, we built our networks and our connections with organizations such as Off The Record, which is a youth counseling service. Um, And they have like things like a webinar system where they're able to offer mental health advice to young people. And we started networking with organizations like that so that we could reach a greater amount of young people within our community in an interactive way. In addition to that, the mentors um, did something. They, they changed and they changed their mental mentoring style quite drastically. So a lot of the mentoring started to happen by phone, but also we had to adapt ourselves to the type of technology that young people like. Um, some young, a lot of the young people we work with didn't like Zoom, actually. They don't like that kind of technology. So instead, they said, no, we prefer WhatsApp video call. Um, so we started yeah. delivering workshops to them on WhatsApp video call. We, during the lockdown, um, we, we won some funding from the Arts Council to run a uh, music project um, called the Positive Vibes Project. And what we did in that project, actually, is we had to call young people and we had to go through music work, a music workshop that we put on YouTube with them um, so that that way they could learn what we were trying to teach them about branding, about marketing um, and about how they will set their businesses up as musicians. Um, so th- those are kind of some of the examples of the way we've been able to tackle it. Um, to like around the month of, of July, we were initially set to run a Taekwondo course by Zoom. Um, we started doing one or two sessions by Zoom, but then we moved to going outside and then obeying the social distancing rules. Okay. So we still ran the Taekwondo it ran for three months and um a young person is due to graduate and get his first belt very soon um so so we we did we were able to um to manage our efforts however when it came to doing things like searching for job opportunities for young people it was impossible for us to do anything about that issue if that made sense because we can't we can send off a cv yeah. but if morrison's is closed now there's yeah. no job anyway. that's yeah. ex- that, i think that's one of the one of the biggest problems right now is, is if if you're unemployed and maybe it's probably even harder if you have a maybe have a criminal history or something and yeah. everywhere's closed and you're trying your best to find a job but then unfortunately as the pressure mounts up you might you know start to think oh where's my money going to come from so i think this is a very difficult time for young people and obviously people in general i mean but it's really good that you guys have been able to adapt to that somewhat and still help as many people as possible yeah 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 but i i think for the foreseeable future that is the future you know the online stuff the video calls and all whatsapp chats or whatever because due to these lockdowns we're restricted from doing things we're used to Mm -hmm. um but that like i said that's probably somewhat challenging but i guess it's a challenge that you guys are ready for it seems like mm-hmm. you're you're prepared and you're continuing con- continuing to do what you're passionate about, um, regardless of the situation. So, what what would you say the the future is for you guys and what you're what what you're up to? Like, what are the plans for the foreseeable right, future? Uh, well, look, this, this is one of the things I love about my company because it's full of people who just have ideas and they don't stop. <laughs> they just don't stop kind of they're like you know they're it's like they're um, pumped up from red bull or something um so I, we are still trying to launch a social enterprise initiative um and this has been including kind of 
trying to open up our own boxing gym at some point in the future and also trying to open up um, something in the e-scooter market as well. Um, in addition to the social enterprise initiative, we aim to be a self-funding organization. We find it a real problem that we have to rely on funding to some extent because, you know, if the it, like what happens is, is at the moment, gang work is kind of popular at the moment because of the county lines. Now, when that no longer becomes fashionable in the eyes of the media, the funding will get cut. And so organizations like ours that will continue to persist there for years and years and be at the forefront of helping on the ground with the issues that we care about, um, because it's gone off the public agenda, yes. we'll no longer have the funding. So we, as far as we're concerned, our main priority is to become self-funded. Um, and, and those, you know, there's a number of initiatives, but those are the two big ones, kind of, e-scooter market and boxing gym. Um, in addition to that, though, um, naturally, the core of our service is mentoring and preventative workshops. We continue to do that. Next week, we'll be in Lyons College in Sutton, um, a people referral unit, and we'll be doing several workshops there, actually. Um, so we're still going in into the institutions that we need to go into to deliver what we need to deliver, including um, the positive leisure activities we spoke of, like music. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of actually kind of maybe the diversification of our services in, the, in a certain way, we will have to speak about as a company, really, the, the way mentoring is able to be delivered to young people in such a, in a certain type of way. So if we have to get a young person to, to write um, a covering letter, or we have to get them to write a business plan. Um, th this has to be facilitated in a different way because usually we can sit down with them and go through it with them kind of thing. Um, we can't do that anymore face to face with them really. One other thing I want to ask you actually is... Um... Yeah. Who who else are you working with? Other organisations or individuals? To what are you branching out with other other groups? Or... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. To, to be honest, for, for, we've had we have a lot of partners anyway. Um, for and um, we've had them for a number of years. So you know we are very closely linked to the Merton Voluntary Service Council. Um, and they are a massive um grassroots community group that kind of brings together all of the different community resources of Merton. And we have a great work coach um, from that organization who's the head of fundraising, Bufa Dusty. Um, she helps us, keeps us financially accountable, and we work quite um, closely with them. Um, also, you know, because we have memorandums of understanding with the local councils, uh, we have agreements to work with them, and they are our partners. Um, in regards to schools and community centers, we're linked up with quite a few schools, Kingsley Primary School, Lyons College. Um, there, are, there are a good few others as well. Um, Community centres, Pollard's Hill, South Mitcham Community Centre. Um, and, and again, there, there are more actually, but I think other members of the company who have been around the company for a bit longer know more uh, about that. Um, re recently, this year, we have, during the lockdown, we started a major partnership initiative and we're building, we're building our networks and our, with other community organisations. So, you know, we're very happy with the partners who we're able to work with now, such as Off The Record, who I mentioned earlier, youth counselling service such as jigsaw for you who are um, a fairly fairly sizable um charity in mitcham um who do who run a lot of different um children's services and services for families such as the um prisoner family service supporting those who have um family members who are in custody basically or imprisoned um also you know they run a child exploitation team as well um We've built a link with Iconic Steps, which is um, a media production company for um, and media media course provider, founded by an award-winning director called Victoria uh, called Victoria Ibije. Um, and we yeah we're working with them on projects as well now. We've formed a relationship with Bettering Education, um, which is a soft skills provider that's commissioned white papers on the lack of soft skills and that and in the private communities and it's linked linked to economic social mobility. Um, we thought we've formed other relationships. We have formed a number of relationships with um, a number of companies now during the pandemic, but we had a number of relationships with a lot of organizations before the pandemic as well. Okay, great. So are you, you're obviously doing a lot of um, talking and liaising with others, which is good. Are you, are you obviously you're mainly based in South London because that's where you guys are from. But like, yeah. are you are you branching out at all? Are you thinking about other parts of London or perhaps other parts of the UK 
or are you more focused on your area right now? Yeah, as a company, we have a policy um, because what we've realised actually is that um, sometimes what gang units will do is they will parachute in someone um, from East London into South London. Yes. And the young person from East London, from South London, will say, you don't know how our gangs operate. And you're actually not from this community. You see, the difference is with the mentors in our organisation, because they grew up in the communities that they're now mentoring young people in, they went, they, the, the young kids who see them went to the same schools as them. And also they saw them growing up in the area and knew them in a, a particular way. And they've used what was once a negative kind of reputation to now have a positive influence. So we stick with our communities because yeah. we believe we know those communities. I think and therefore we... Sorry. Yeah. I, I think that's very important because um, sometimes, and specifically with, maybe with policing as well, um, especially, is that if a young person is being told what to do by someone who doesn't fully understand their experience, obviously if you're like if you're from that sort of background and you're sort of working class, you do understand that experience to a certain degree. But it's like, yeah, if, yeah. let's say if you're like, I'm from Bournemouth or and like a youth worker from London came to Bournemouth and was talking to teenagers there trying to tell them how things work. It's not really the same thing. So I feel yeah. like I feel like it's very important to retain the economy and and within the community basically so do you think you guys are doing that in a way with your business ideas for funding so like uh you talked about the um so what was it called arts council the arts council and the, you know the small the small projects you're doing to fund yourselves is is that very community yeah. focused as well yeah yeah um, uh, yeah it is is all community focused i mean the taekwondo was run um predominantly with young people in, in Mitchum, really. Um, the music course was done with our clients already. And because our clients are referred to us from um, from the IOM, the Integrated Defender Management Agency, they are referred mostly from the boroughs that we serve. So Merton, Sutton and Croydon, to be honest with you, that's where they come from. So those music projects will run with them. Um, when it came to the mentoring, we had funding for mentoring from London Community Foundation and the Mercer Monetary Service Council as well. Um, that funding, once again, uh, was was being used for our existing clients, um, and they are referred from me the, from these um, boroughs. However, <coughs> Sutton is quite um, Sutton is on the border of Richmond and Kingston, and those are two areas that we are now working towards getting involved in. But again, we know those areas. We grew up in those areas. Do you see what I mean? And they're very close localities still. So there is a, um, a small expansion, but the expansion yeah. is within a comfort zone, if that makes sense, that we are familiar with and that we know. Okay. So focusing on your, obviously, within the community you're representing, do you, what do you feel that is unique about the situation in, in South London and your area than it is maybe in different parts of London or other cities? Right. What, what I'm going to do is two things for this question with you. Um, I'm going to focus on my own experience growing up in South London. Because I, I grew up in South London, but I have cousins and, and friends in East London. Um, so therefore, I can draw the, the differences that I saw when I was younger, actually, between um, the, the, the criminality and the gangs that operate in our two different parts of, of London. Then what I will do is I'll take you to now what young people are experiencing now on the back of what the mentors have informed me of and what we speak about as a company. So first of all, going from my own experience, there, there are very, um, there, were, there were, especially particularly for Croydon, which is where I grew up, I grew up in Fortin Heath, um, which is a very deprived part of Croydon. So it, it, when I was growing up, there was not really an emphasis so much, even though we did emphasize postcodes among our gangs, um, we did not, how do I explain it? We were not like Hackney or like um, Stoke Newington, where estate to estate were rival gangs. We weren't operated and we didn't and we didn't base ourselves on that model. We had a very big, we had a, a model that was very expansive. So for example, in my area in Croydon, there were two um, big gangs, very big gangs. 
there were um, there was one called DSN, and there was one called SMN, or or and their, their elders were Gypsy. So okay. when it came when it came to those gangs, you can have those two gangs who were rivals to each other for many years. However, there were other there are other st- gang structures usually originating in Brixton that kind of that both gangs could belong to. So, for example, you can have a DSN member and a Gypset member who are rivals who are both part of the South London Bloods, oh, okay. um, which is something that originated That's in Brixton. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So across like multiple parts of South London, really, um, the Bloods used to operate. From Brixton down to Croydon, and even not really in Peckham, because Peckham was kind of a blue borough and it was a whole different kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, the, 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 the structure of, of South London Bloods, actually, or what was called Blood Set back then, expanded across multiple regions of South London, across different towns and different boroughs. Okay. And so it was not isolated, like Hackney and Stoke Newington were isolated, where each, basically, where each um, gang was based on an estate that they lived on. So th- those structures were different in that kind of way. I- in addition to that as well, um, the truth is, in some ways, South London is probably a bit luckier than places in certain parts of East London and North London because there's a lot more gun work or gun um, crime that happens in East and North London from what I've known of, of the communities that I've been around. Um, in South London, it's mostly a knife thing okay. um, and, a we- and, and an offensive weapon thing. But it's not really actually a gun thing. And in North London and in East London, certain parts of it, it is really a straight gun thing for most of them. Do you know and do, so, you, do you know why that is? Or is it just a fluke? Like Yeah, no, that's that that you've asked me a very interesting question. If, if I ponder it, I, there, there's two things actually. I think actually the gangs in Hackney, places like Hackney and Stoke Newington have been more established and longer established. And yes. their gang culture has been longer established. So on the back of that, um, how do I put it? The the level of the level the acceptable levels of violence were different were were are different to them than they were to us in South London. In South London, to carry a knife with you or some kind of a weapon with you was kind of a big deal. It was like, yeah, that's a serious person, kind of who's about serious stuff. But in East London, that would be looked at as nothing. I was in a conversation with a group of people from East London and I was from South London and I was 14 at the time. And I was the only room, only one in the room who hadn't seen a gun, actually. Um, and, and they were all surprised that I hadn't seen a gun. So, uh, you know, it, it does show the difference. In South London, the, the levels of acceptable violence were different at the end of the day than what, than what they probably are in parts of North and East London. Obviously, I speak from a past experience that I had many years ago. You know, we go yeah. over a decade ago. I'm not speaking, so that that is the that is the thing. The structure of the gangs are, are very different, but also um, something actually that may be different from from even from times that were before when I was younger to now. Actually, is that there's a lot more recruiting that goes on, and actually, there there is um, how do I put it? Once upon a time, like if because people the directors of my company are from an older generation than me. Um, and when they were involved in what they were involved in and all this kind of stuff, what happened is many of them had genuine reasons. Like they had to escape, um, vi- they had to escape violence, if, uh, sorry, um, racist violence. Okay. And so they came together as one community and then that turned into crime at a later stage. Um, other people tried to escape poverty. In my generation, it was very different actually because it was, it was more of a recruiting thing and a status thing okay. actually. And, and basically a kind of a subculture thing. Um, so so young people would be involved in kind of, they would want to be with the trend. And the trend was partly influenced by the grime culture. But even though grime culture has its positive sides as well, positive musicians in that in that culture. But there were some elements of the grime culture, basically, that came in and the street culture. Um, and, and sooner or later, many different people wanted to, to take on that culture, even if they weren't from that kind of background. And those who didn't take on that culture, actually, many of them were made victims in, in the areas. So really, there were young people who may come from um, good backgrounds. Their, their parents could have worked hard their whole lives and be good people who taught them good values. But from the moment they get into school, everyone has weapons on them. Not only does everyone have weapons on them, 
they see drugs being sold inside the school. It, for many young people, some young people are strong enough to resist um, to resist the fear, actually, or the climate of fear that exists when you're in that kind of environment. But a, young, a lot of young people are not strong enough, actually, to address, to, to resist the climate of fear. And when they're in that particular environment, all of a sudden, they, as far as they're concerned, I don't really have a choice but to pick up this weapon now. Okay. Because everybody around me has got it. And just, but if I walk down the street towards, say, say if, I, if I'm going from um, Fort and Heath into West Croydon, which is like a bus ride away, a short bus ride, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I know that in West Croydon, that's where all the people congregate and all the gangs congregate. But remember, you're a school kid. So you have to go to and from, from school. And your school yes, might be course, um, yeah. in South Croydon. Yeah, so you have to go through these areas. But you know that when you get off the bus in West Croydon, all the gangs will be there. And there always were congregation spots for gangs. And I've looked in my community to this point, and it looks like there's still congregation spots for gangs. So um, when, these, when you're in the congregation spot at the end of the day, you know that you could be sitting there maybe with two, three of your friends, and a group of maybe 10 boys might come and just, and they call it move to you. So they might just come and try to rob you for whatever you have on you. What do you do? Because you see a lot of things for young people, it becomes, because there's a yes. culture that surrounds, that's around at the time, it becomes very difficult for young people to manage and deal with that situation. Because you see, if they get robbed in front of their friends, they're seen as weak. And actually for young boys in particular, they're seen as not being men actually, if they, if they exhibit any kind of fear. And yeah, so they feel like the they have to defend themselves or like yeah, find yeah. people that will help defend them. And that's when the cycle but, sort of... Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. So, so sorry, so that's just my, my experience of it, yeah. Now, to take it now to what young people are facing today, um, it appears for in some areas, the gangs that, actually, I know this for a fact, some of the gangs that used to operate when I was younger in places like Clapham, they still exist um, to this very day. Um, what that means now is that the, the older people um, who are from my generation, and I'm 27, uh, they trained young people to take on to take over after them, actually. Yeah. Um, and in my in my day, there were um, you had you had an older, then you had a younger who was underneath the older was recruited by him. Then you had a tiny who was beneath the younger, and then you had a little, um, which was beneath the tiny. Um, so you had four levels of the of, of the gang chain, actually, of the gang family of one. <laughs> we could almost call it one kind of gang bloodline, actually. Yeah. So what has that happened? Is on probably from the back of that recruitment process, which was really like more or less across South London, that's how it used to work. Or, or work. Um, where it's now a situation where obviously the tinies and the littles um, have obviously taken over from what their um, elders represent. Okay. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised at all actually if um, if even the, the same names still exist actually the same uh, the same gang names. Not so, not the titles of the gangs, but the names of individual gang members still exist. Okay, yeah. So, so the, gangs, would, the gangs change, would, but the the people are the same, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or uh, yeah, or the, the yeah. It's the younger generation now has taken over from the older generation. They, it's like they've taken over. They, it's like um, if you take over, <laughs> if you take over kind of a kingdom or whatever, you like yeah. you know, you rise up the ranks and it's you've now like got feudal, into the yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's almost it's like, like Game of right. Thrones or something in a way. Like, yeah, it's yeah, not no, to it's, trivialize it's, it, but it's like the whole, no, I know, I know. you know, the the whole structure of of people obviously going to prison and people, you know, passing away and then other people taking their place and all this stuff is is it's quite shocking when you think about it. Um, so how do you how do you bridge that generation gap? For I guess one of my last questions, because obviously, like. You said, you know, you're you're 27, and you know, I'm I'm 24, which is younger than you, but like I'm still like, I can't go to a 15 year old and really relate to their experience, and mm. so how do you explain to somebody, especially when you have like a lot of the culture around it, like maybe certain like glamorization in certain like films and music, if mm. how do you how do you bridge that gap and say try and find like a connection with them? Right. Well, well, for us, and especially for the mentors, it's very easy for them um, because actually the fact is, is they were ex-offenders, if that makes sense. Some of them went to prison. Some of them were, were high ranking members of gangs. Um, actually, you know, the, the fact is, actually, 
for example, one of our, our mentors can say, oh, actually, um, I've been to prison and you haven't right now. So I know what you're going to go through. And trust me, none of your friends will be there for you, actually. All of your gang members will abandon you when that happens. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that we can we can say that to them from lived experience means something. Also, you've got to remember, um, instead of them looking, how do I put it? They look up to the older members of their gangs because these are more experienced people who have, quote unquote, lived the game. Now, our mentors have lived the game as well. But the difference is that people have lived the game and are now saying, no, we change. Um, we changed our ways and we don't believe in this anymore. And so they become, they, they have, you see, when you've lived a certain life, you have a certain authenticity and that authenticity comes with authority. Yeah. So course, yeah. one of our, you, the young person can't turn to one of our mentors and say, oh, you're just some posh guy that came from another area trying to tell me how to live. No, our mentors will tell you, no, we grew up in poverty as well. But we're telling you this is not the right way, actually. And you see, when you can come from that, that strong lived experience, actually, it's very hard for people to then turn around to you and say, you don't know what you're talking about, actually. Because we do know what we're talking about. Because we've been through it. We, we, there's, um, there's this phrase, it's um, been there, worn the T-shirt. Mm -hmm. And it's kind, of, it's kind of that kind of frank conversation we can have with them about it. And just uh, the last thing on your question on that point is actually... Um, it is it's so deep, actually, because we focus on our own communities, people like the, mem the mentors in our company can explain to young people things about their gangs that they didn't even understand. So, for example, if Mi just for example, um, if Mitchum has a rivalry with Wandsworth, the fact is the members of our company were there when that rivalry first began, when the two areas first went to gang war against each other. Yeah, so they have a background and knowledge, actually, yeah. Yeah, so they have the actual knowledge of how this all began, actually, and what happened and what took place. And they can use that knowledge and say, look, this is what happened on this day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, someone may have been killed, actually, which is why, which is why the cir circumstances happen as it's happened. Now, this is my take on it as your mentor um, in terms of what actually we, us, actually, made happen on that day. Um. And I'm giving you that knowledge and that understanding of what happened on that day of the week now so that you understand that yeah. actually, even I am saying as someone who was involved in it at the time, this is not worth it for you. One f one final thing, actually, and then we'll end. Yeah. Because uh, I feel like this is a important thing to talk about. When you when you went back to t earlier, when you were talking about the situation in South London yeah. and how, like, you know, it was like you spoke about sort of like bloods and like sort of Americanisms. Do you think that? Yeah. Do you think that has an what effect? Do you think that's had on like sort of British kind of gang culture? Like, do you think that's something that you've noticed that's that's influencing young people, or do you think it's more down to other factors? You mean the Americanization of, of urban street culture? Yes. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. What what I would say is this: um, the history of the gangs of South London is extensive, and it goes back about thirty or forty years ago. Um, in terms of the most recent, of the terms of the gang life, the gang format that exists today and lifestyle that exists today, it began with PDC and it began, began with the South Muslim soldiers. Now, those two gangs were not Americanized actually. Um, it just happened they were descendants. Many of them of many of them of Jamaican descent um, who had parents who were gangsters, actually. Yeah. Um, and as they had parents who were gangsters, they then carried, they then developed their own type of unique South London gangsterism. As time, remember when, the, the truth is about hip hop culture, when two, when people like Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls, um, sp like, rapped and became international stars, the reason why they became international stars well not just because obviously they were fantastic musicians that's not the only reason it's because they spoke to a generate to generations across the western world who mm -hmm. felt like they had they had faced similar social conditions in ghettoized communities basically tupac with his rise and biggie smalls with his rise they spoke to the ghettos around the world no longer just the ghettos in america yeah. and so you see for, for many people when we talk about the Americanization of urban culture, 
it just so happened that the voice of the streets of in and that that really captivated and um the experience that many young people were going through uh, um happened to be american and then because of that because th th these people spoke for the experiences and on top of that you know we have a media culture where we have in the movie industry the american star system where things are based on celebrity culture and all of these kind of things celebrities have a particular position in our society and they are icons in our society Tupac and Biggie and then many musicians who came after that whether it was Little Wayne um you know maybe not Drake so much because he does the soft songs but I'm trying to think of gangster rappers maybe like it was like Twister and yeah. maybe that like, there's so there's so many of them um at the end of the day these people eventually they became the icons for the streets if that made sense they became our personalized celebrities those who we could relate to on a fundamental level of our experiences poverty deprivation and crime mm -hmm. and we understood them we got their language and for that reason because we had we how do i pull it we decoded if i'm talking from a media perspective on the back of our own experiences what they meant to us as our yeah. figures and that's really where the americanization comes in there had to be a fundamental part of us that related to them in the first place and growing up in western systems and ghettoized communities is a major part of that so and then that that combined with celebrity culture and the special position celebrities have in the eyes of the world at the end of the day um, and how they influence kind of how we see them. You know, there's a reason why there's gossip columns in newspapers, because people are interested in the lives of celebrities. They connect to the lives yeah. of celebrities in a different way and on a different level than they connect to the lives of their neighbor. It's far more impressive to them. It means far more to them. Do you see what I mean? In, in some type of ways. And so we connected with those experiences based on the fact that we understood where they were coming from in the first place. And then they became our role models. And then we took things off of them and increased with them, but and, and increased and increased with that. And it, that exists even to this day. But there's two other parts that I would add to that, which is that um, as time has gradually gone on, we've been influenced by um, UK, um, American culture, but we do have our own UK culture. Grime is a uniquely East London and then now London wide thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and now even UK wide thing actually. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, drill music is a particularly London thing. Now, actually, I, I don't know yet. Drill music may even have gone to other parts of the country by now, but drill music yeah. is just a part of youth culture, if that makes sense. So, and that's a uniquely thing actually. That's not um, Americanized really. Yes. Yeah. I think I think to just to agree with your point. Um, also, the hip hop, the hip, the American hip hop culture influence and not now you know in the uk there's you know grime and drill and like uk rap and all this stuff i feel like that's like very emblematic to young people because it's like the globalization of like sort of working class experience yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. Like, you know where wherever you go you know if it's like you know it's it's kids in london or like even kids in in other parts of the country who may not have the same background as kids in London, it's they relate to it because it's a it's mm. similar it's similar experiences. Uh, mm. They they listen to the same music, they dress the same way. There's really no mm. difference. It kind of blurs the lines of division. So I feel like that's a very important mm. thing that's come out of of sort of urban music culture. Um, I think there's there's a unity in that. Do you know what I mean? So like, where's, uh, yeah. like you'll find murals of, of, of rappers in, you know, like in Colombia or in Palestine or Poland, just all over the world. Mm. And I think that's a good thing in general. That yeah, working yeah. class people have sort of slowly, obviously we've had a troubled history, you know, there's all sorts of things that have gone on in the past, you know, like, you know like class politics and racial politics but i feel like working class people are sort of coming together in a way because we've realized there's a shared sort of suffering despite our differences yeah no I, i'm with you on that and you know when when tupac um, wrote the song changes mm -hmm. um at the end of the day that had a massive impact on many people and many people play that song even to this yeah. day just because of how inspirational it was 
But you, you see, Tupac made a point in an interview actually once. And he said, I'm not saying I'm a gangster because I want to rob you and rape you. I'm saying it because I'm from the I'm from the gutter and I'm still here. Mm -hmm, so yeah. for, from his perspective, he was telling a survival story, actually. And then you see when when things because like people like Tupac and Biggie Smalls led the way, and then it, it gave room for other musicians, some of them who had a different perspective and a different way of looking at it and were more conscious and could influence the culture in a certain way. You know, you've got certain um, rappers, they're all about girls and, and sex, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, then you have other people who they're all about money and gangsters. But then you have people like Nas, for example. I'm very conscious yeah. and very informed about his history. And you see, these are, now, if it wasn't for Tupac globalizing, as you put it, basically, um, ghetto, the, the kind of the voice of ghetto communities and working class communities, Someone like Nas could not rise in the way he rose to give a positive message that is teaching young people I can, for example, yeah. you know, be what I want to be. And, you know, teaching them about their history and, and really teaching them about his conception kind of of how the structure of how the structures of this civilization are affecting all of us as human beings. So the, 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 the doors have opened up in terms of what hip hop represented. And when the doors open up, you'll always get people who come in who can um, who can put a positive influence on the doors that have opened up. Don't get me wrong. We know Nas talks about gangsterism sometimes, but most of his stuff is positive and conscious. Mm -hmm. But he say, he say he's speaking in this way because he says that at the end of the day, yes, I am from the ghetto at the end of the day, but I ha I'm, ha I'm knowledgeable. And you see that for a young person, that can be a very powerful message for them because it means now they're not just thinking to be um to be a gangster or not or to be a gangster or to be from the ghetto. I have to be um a, um an ignorant individual who has no knowledge of anything. Actually, someone like Nas coming about representing what he represents actually shows no, I can actually be from the ghetto and actually be very intelligent. Yeah, I, I think I think that is the overall message of of of. Uh, I guess you, what you guys do and what youth work is in general and, and maybe this, this episode of, of this show is that is sort of a cut, overcoming adversity and mm. you help people do that and mm. I, young people can transcend their circumstances and they can do better. Mm. It, it might seem like it's, it's hard to reach um, but yeah, I, I think I think it, it, if we continue down that road, we'll continue to see good results from it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely with you. I think that the future can be very bright for for many young people. Um, but you see, it, it does require like because I, I I'm very interested in the history, in in philosophy and in politics, um, and even in things like the Enlightenment mm -hmm. and. I think really, you see, in periods of history, such as the Renaissance, or even before the Renaissance, the Islamic Golden Age, or after the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, or after the Enlightenment, the period after World War II, really, you know, there are fundamental shifts that happen in the history of civilizations. And actually, they happen in all civilizations around the world. They go through phases where there's intense development. And obviously, African Americans had that phase as well. They had the Harlem Renaissance, and they also had Black Wall Street as well. Um, so when do you think? When sorry, yeah. do you think in 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 Britain that needs to happen more? Yeah, and I think it needs to. I think really, we need a time of intense development. Actually, and and as I'm just speaking to you, it makes me think actually quite intensely. For organizations that are like my own, that are able to, I don't really want to use the word benefit because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a terrible thing, young people that are going through the county lines. But for those of us who are able to make a positive impact from the funding that we're able to generate because of the uh, media focus on the county lines and the issue of gang violence as is now seen on the public agenda, we should be using that really as a groundswell, actually, um, to really transform our community in immense ways. So that the, the transformation is not just that we've dealt with a social issue, actually, but that we've 
reformed our entire communities so that we can have a positive social destiny, basically. Yeah, I think I think that comes down to learning history, as you said. I mean, I think in schools and in our uh, in our homes, we're maybe not we're not we're not taught about history, especially in this country. You know, you had the, you know you had the you know awful sort of racism of the seventies and eighties for the black community, and then you had the, all kinds of horrific stuff that happened in this country towards working class people. You know, there's the Peterloo massacre, and you know um, the uh, it's gone out of my mind. Rece- I've lost that point, but recently Grenfell as well. You know, it's I feel working class people in general feel like they're they're not important, and if mm. if if they learn about their history and learn about the this, this, this suffering that's happened to their ancestors and they can build on that and know that you can always cut, overcome adversity basically mm. yeah no i think i think it is it is very important and you know what, what i'll just touch on with you is that um is that like there is something to be said about the unity of, of working class communities because Unfortunately, I've been I've seen things in my life growing up actually where it's happened in a quite negative way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, when, when I was at school in my year group, the the um, actually not even the youngest, the tinies of BSN, um, and the tinies of SMN, they used to hang out together in the playground and smoke weed. Now, basically, what? How do I explain it? Um, a lot of the boys who were in the 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 lowest or the youngest ranks of BSN who were in my school at the time when I was probably about 13 or 14, um, they mo- a lot of them were white, actually. They were white yeah. working-class boys. Um, and a lot of the people from SMN were black working-class boys. Um, and they got together, but they would hang out together with each other in the playground smoking weed. And you see, unfo- it's, it's just unfortunate that maybe sometimes that bond doesn't form in other places in the way it should do in a massive way because they bonded together as gang members basically um who are from different racial backgrounds but they, they are all from the same social economic yeah. position um and if we if that could be expanded that you know it's not gangs doing that but it's actually um it is really kind of working class communities of all different stratas working together for common objectives then that will really help us all, to be honest with you, because I'll, I'll put it to you like this, because I'm I'm very passionate and interested in black history. And along in, in the very early beginnings of the black power movement um, in America, there was a man called Noble Draw Lee, and he was the founder of an organization called the Moorish Science Temple, which was the precursor to many other black power organizations that then came after him. When he spoke, when he spoke about the, na- the nature of the world that we live in, he said that there are three types of people, or the world is divided into three groups of people, I should say. He said 3% are the people who try to control the world. He said 5% are the poor righteous teachers who try to help the ignorant masses. And I wouldn't use the word ignorant myself, but that's the way he described it. And then you have the um, the 92% who, who, who he described as the masses. So... At the end of the day, I, I, to me personally, I do follow kind of how he put the framework of the world in that way, actually. And to me, the, the 3% may be black, white, Asian, Chinese, African, whatever they are at mm-hmm. the end of the day. But they are systemically controlling the futures of the people, of the masses. And the 5%, I've never, Nobu Ali did not say this, and I personally definitely don't believe at all, actually, that the 5%, who are there to try to help and liberate the masses from the control that the 3% have over them are um, unnecessarily white or black, if or white or black, not or one or the other, if that makes sense. There's been white people, black people, Chinese people, Asian people, people from all different um, stra- parts of life at the end of the day who have tried to challenge the elite systems that exist in this world. Yeah, I think, I think to sort of summarize that one final point is um, I feel like we're sort of indoctrinated 
within media and society and like as you said it starts off in the playground you know kids get along well they're from a similar social background they wear the same clothes they listen to the same music they like the same things they talk about i don't know about girls or whatever <laughs> and they they there's at that stage there's fundamental no difference and then at some mm. point a wedge is planted in people's minds by politicians and teachers and whoever Mm. And and it, it it distracts them from a wider cause, and I feel like that's one of my that's one of my biggest inspirations for sort of working and doing videos of sort of a working class content is to bring people together and hopefully have them learn from me because obviously I'm not an expert in anything, but I, I try. I feel like it's good to use this platform to do that. Um, mm. And one of the things is uh, one of the things that I'll just end on is that as as a Muslim, my one of my big inspirations is like Malcolm X, especially when he went yeah. he went to Mecca for the Hajj, mm -hmm. and he came back and he said he said that he had uh, you know white people and black people and Asian people all treating him as a brother mm -hmm. just because they mm -hmm. shared the same religion. And I think yeah. that's that's it might sound a bit cliche, but that's that's what we have to try and do as a society is mm. to try and forget about these these lines of division. But I, obviously it's it's hard and there's historical reasons why they exist. I never deny that. Obviously. Yeah, the, but of course, and, and to, I'll, I'll, sorry, just very quickly, because you said an interesting point and. I've always loved the history of Islam, actually, because it's a tremendous religion that's done a lot to um, a lot for the world, which has never really been recognised inside Western systems. How much Islam has done for the history of humanity, actually. But um, the Quran says something. It says the best among you. It says it says basically it says something to the effect that the best among you is an example for all of you. So, in other words, yeah, people like, like the Prophet, Mu yeah, the people like the Prophet Muhammad and or, or, or the prophets of the Scripture are not there for just one community that they are there for all of us as an example to live by yes but yeah i think we want to take examples from from those sort of ideas and or just or, or just general just people in history and realize the the i guess the message is unity and I, I hope that's what we can achieve i hope that's what you guys can achieve with your organization and you can continue to tackle the problems within your community I think it's really important yeah i think i think we're gonna end there if that's okay that's that's totally fine um, yeah it's been a good discussion it's been a good actually. discussion it's been nice to speak to you bro um no, i think yeah, maybe no. in future maybe get some of the other people from your organization on board if they want to come down you know i'm working on different yeah, things so if any anybody that's watching this video as well like you know i i know i've been a bit lackluster like i haven't done a lot of projects but this is the start of something that's looking positive for me so i hope you guys enjoyed this this episode and thank you very much uh, thank you for thank having you. me